Thank you, Doki. All right, so the subject today is inflammatory liver diseases. Uh, and this was a question in my membership exam, actually, uh, which was probably eight years ago now, nine years maybe. So it might be fair game to come up again. Um, has anybody had, um, have there been any liver questions already in the written papers? We had a question um, on the um, small animal membership paper um, last week on a shunt dog. Was it? Um, and did that present, was it just a kind of, um, this dog comes in with elevated ALT or was it a neuro presentation or? It was a six month old um, dog that was smaller than its litter mates, had episodes of dullness, um, that sort of thing. I can't actually remember all the details. I've sort of blanked them out, but. Yeah. I was just thinking more, they tend to sort of ask one question from every body system sort of thing. So if we've already covered liver, you guys can almost forget everything we're talking about and just have a little holiday, study holiday. Um, so hopefully that's the only question about liver. Um, but this is a nice one, I think, um, inflammatory liver diseases in particular with um, just having biochem you know what do you do next how do you get to the bottom of it how relevant is it to determine what type of hepatitis it is um, and particularly I think a nice question is um, describe the difference in forms of hepatitis most commonly seen in dogs versus cats can somebody give me a bit of a quick answer to that question in cats it's mostly neutrophilic cholangitis is that what you're getting at yeah, yeah, exactly. So the regions of the liver affected by inflammation in the cat versus the dog. Regions. I don't, when I say regions, I just mean like biliary versus hepatic parenchyma. Oh, so dogs, it's more hepatic parenchyma, whereas cats, it's more hepatobiliary. Exactly. Yeah, so it's quite rare for cats to actually get inflammation in their hepatic parenchyma. It's usually really focused around the biliary system. Um, and Pooja's right, um, neutrophilic cholangitis is probably the one that we recognise most commonly. But I think that's probably more because we um, the presentation is more spectacular. It's more of an acute disease. They come in sick and therefore we go looking and we find the cause. Whereas I think lymphoplasmocytic cholangitis and particularly as an extension of that triaditis or inflammatory bowel disease in cats is is actually very common but very hard to diagnose because you don't often do biopsies of gallbladder walls and things um and in fact biopsy in the cat liver biopsy in the cat is just harder um because they're um uh, it, sh it shouldn't technically be harder but just because they're smaller and there's less liver tissue to biopsy and things um, okay, so let's go. I just want to review the anatomy or the microscopic anatomy of the liver quickly. So I'm just going to share one image in this talk, um, which should be coming up now. Can everyone see that? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this is a picture of histo of a liver. Um, now you can see there's two kind of labelled areas, there's a central vein. What's um, what's the central vein's function in the liver? Where does the blood go that goes into the central vein? Systemic circulation. Good. Eventually. Yeah. yeah. So central vein, hepatic veins, cava, heart, systemic circulation. Um, so the central vein is like the plug hole of the liver. It's where everything drains or the blood drains out of and goes back into systemic circulation. So by the time the blood gets there, it has to be filtered, toxin-free, clean as a whistle, no bacteria in it because um, it's all going into systemic circulation. Um, what about the portal triad? What structures comprise the portal triad? Portal veins. Sorry. You go, Jeff. 
Oh, okay. So the bile ducts and I think there's an artery and vein, systemic artery and vein too, isn't there? Yeah, yeah. which vein? Yeah, it would be an hepatic vein. Well, the name is the clue, Jeff. Sorry? The name of the triad is the clue. Oh, the portal vein. Oh. <laughs> Sorry. No trick question. I knew you knew that. <laughs> um, okay, so we've got the bile duct, we've got the portal vein, and we've got the hepatic artery. So as far as kind of looking at movement of blood, bile, and things through this kind of structure, blood that comes through the hepatic artery is going to flow from the portal triad towards the central vein, right? Along the sinusoids. Where's bile going to be flowing? What direction? Yes, good, exactly. So it's a really important concept to have in your mind that blood flows away from the portal triad towards the central vein and bile flows away from the central vein towards the portal triad. It's drained, they're draining into separate ends. Um, so say we had an extra hepatic biliary obstruction and we had hepatic inflammation associated with that. Where is going to become inflamed? Zone one, two, or three first? Three. Zone three first. Why? Because the bile is coming from that direction. So if there's extra hepatic obstruction, like it won't come in. Oh, okay. So the bile is being produced by all of these hepatocytes and then it's kind of been going into canaliculi along the way. So if you've got a blockage here, the flow is oh. going to slow down. Zone here one. Zone zone one. Then. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Um, so zone one for extra hepatic biliary obstruction. And then what about if we have a reactive hepatitis in a dog? So the liver is reacting to something that's coming from the gastrointestinal tract. Still zone one then. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yep. So periportal. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. What about if we've got chronic exposure to a hepatotoxin? Also zone one. Such a good question. And um, the... Is that where, where it could be zone three because it takes it like it's sat, sat with the tissues for longer? Yes. So zone three hepatocytes have more responsibility for detoxification. They have more P450 cytochrome activity than the other zones. So if you've got a toxin hitting the liver, it's going to end up impacting zone three hepatocytes more than the other zones. So centrilobular. So that's just a really nice kind of, I guess, conceptually, we know where the blood's going, we know where the bile's going, we know where the toxins are being processed. Does anybody have any questions about the kind of microscopic anatomy? No. Say you've got a primary hepatic toxin, which is causing hepatocyte swelling and necrosis mostly in zone three, but you've also got an ALP elevation on your blood tests. How, when you kind of look at this anatomy, can you picture how intrahepatic cholestasis would work, would happen? Swelling of the cells kind of closes over your bile caniculi. Yes, very good, exactly. So I want you to picture now a dog that's got a hyperbilirubinemia secondary to a diffuse hepatic injury or diffuse hepatic swelling. The degree of swelling there has to be to block all of those canaliculi enough to get a bilirubin elevation. 
So it's a really nice just picture to have in your head. Like we really need to decrease the inflammation here, decrease the swelling to restore flow through the liver and liquefy the bile as much as we can as well. And what happens when bile sits around and isn't able to flow? It damages tissues. Exactly. So it causes inflammation. So whatever the primary injury was, if you then end up with intrahepatic cholestasis, it's going to perpetuate that inflammatory response. So Does then, that depend on what type of bile acid it is? Um, yes, it does. So primary bile acids are not as inflammatory as secondary bile acids, but when bile sticks around, it's allowed to change form. Mm -hmm. And bile, whilst it's not as inflammatory, it's still inflammatory. Um, so I think the point I want to make before we kind of dive into the discussion on hepatitis is it's rarely one factor that causes liver inflammation. It might be an inciting factor. And then after that, you get cholestasis causing inflammation or you get an immune mediated response trying to clear up that original injury causing inflammation. Um, there's, it's so often idiopathic when it becomes chronic because there's so many different factors which will impact the, it, the formation of inflammation in the liver. But doing biopsies and understanding where that inflammation is on your biopsy will really help you understand what's causing that inflammation, whether it's immune mediated, cholestasis, toxicity. Um, and also what other information do we get out of a biopsy will help us um, understand the etiology? Where the copper accumulation is. Good, yeah, exactly. So if we've got a dog with genetic inability to excrete copper, where is the inflammation going to be? Zone one. Um, I need to check myself on this. Make sure I'm not talking things out. Sorry. Uh, well, they, and then all the other, like, so if that's like Bedlington Terrier's yeah. zone one, well, it's like one zone one, the other, all the others are zone three of the exactly. secondary, but it could be the other way around. <clears throat> I am just double checking. I think you're right, but Bedlington's a special. I can't find it in my notes. Because um, is it the so same premise the about... All the others are zone three. Yeah, so, so it's a, zone one. Because is it the same premise as um, uh, like exogenous toxins that the copper accumulation accumulates in zone three with the secondary <laughs> versus not having the OMDD gene in yes. zone one? Yep. So um, did everybody follow that? So with dogs that get copper deposition secondary to inflammation, their copper is going to accumulate in zone three where we would normally see the toxicity causing the most effect. Whereas mm -hmm. dogs that have a primary genetic mutation, which prohibits them being able to excrete copper from their hepatocytes, the mm -hmm. copper is going to accumulate in zone one. And with copper comes inflammation. Why? Oxidative damage, because it is, um, it's, I don't know why. Because <laughs> it, it's, yeah. Does it um, affect the metalloproteinase or like displaces glutathione or something like that? It does. Um, it essentially, it causes oxidant damage. Um, glutathione will become exhausted, supply will become exhausted by trying to mop up the oxidants um, because that's uh, um, oh my gosh, I forgot, an antioxidant. Antioxidant. Um, 
I don't know about the metalloproteinase. I, pro I definitely knew at some point in my career that information, but you won't need to know that for memberships and therefore mm -hmm. I forgot. <laughs> That's okay. Um, okay, so let's go to, let's talk a little bit about cats first. I'm gonna stop sharing. Does anybody want to keep this picture up for their um, interest or reference? I'm going to stop sharing yeah. so I can see you all. Is are, um, all um, histopathologists equally sort of good at giving you this information you need specific based on, you know, liver biopsies or are you sending to a special lab? Um, I always send to Vetnostics um, just because they follow the World Small Animal Veterinary Association has really good guidelines on reporting liver histo and um, all, all labs will follow it, basically. Right. Um, the, okay. That's yeah, scary. yeah. It, it's really, it's one of the only conditions, like both endoscopic biopsies of the gastrointestinal tract and histo of the liver, both needle and chunks, um, are pretty standardised. Cool. Yeah. Uh, okay, so why do cats get more biliary disease than dogs? Uh, it's to do with the anatomy, where the, like the, the common, like they don't, where the bile duct sort of opens in the duodenum. So it's an ascending infection. And usually with neutrophilic uh, cholangitis, it's unresolved in, uh, infection that's there. Mm -hmm. Yep. So most commonly uh, infectious cause of the cholangitis. And it starts as infectious, but then it might turn into non-infectious but immune-mediated like perpetuation of that inflammation. Um, does everybody know what Pooja is talking about with the difference in anatomy between the biliary ducts in dogs and cats? Should have got a picture of this. Um, so essentially, oh my gosh, I'm going to get this wrong. Um, dogs have a valve which means that bacteria, it's harder for bacteria to get up into their gallbladder. And typically the only time we see biliary infection in dogs is when they've had its secondary to vomiting. So they vomit and they have this huge force of contraction in the gastrointestinal tract and positive pressure forces the bacteria up there. Whereas cats, it's not quite as kind of protected from gastrointestinal microbiome. Um, very much fellowship um, nerd interest. But the other thing with cats, which is really interesting, that's not potentially not bacterial, that an argument for it not being bacterial in origin is that, you know, our cats get IBD all the time. Dogs get IBD all the time too. Why do cats have their pancreas and their gallbladder also, or their biliary system also affected by that? Um, and something that they've discovered is that the lymphocytes, every lymphocyte, is kind of programmed to respond to inflammation in a certain area. So if you've got the body telling the lymphocytes to come to an area and respond to inflammation, um, usually the lymphocytes will stick to that area. And the, the way that they know where to go is by these molecules called adrescens. So in a dog, you mount an inflammatory response and the lymphocytes with adrescens addressing them to the gastrointestinal tract go to the gastrointestinal tract. Whereas in cats, the, ad the address in the bowel, the pancreas, the pancreatic ducts, and the lining of the biliary system is all the same. So they get all the lymphocytes, which would normally just go to the bowel, going to the pancreas and the gallbladder as well. And therefore we see this link between triaditis, you know, if we've got inflammation in the bowel, those lymphocytes don't know the difference. And there's not been enough work on that to establish causation there, but there's that's a big difference, species difference between cats and all other species, essentially. Wow. Nerd fact for the day. <laughs> um, okay. So how would a cat with neutrophilic cholangitis present to you? Lethargic anorexic, may or may not have fever. Mm -hmm. What would the blood work look like? Probably 
ALT elevation, ALP elevation may have hyperbilirubinemia. Mm -hmm. What have you had? Possibly neutrophilia. Good. But not yeah. always. I mean, you can't rule that out just because it's not there. No. What percentage of cats with neutrophilic cholangitis who are acutely unwell have an elevated ALP or PAP? Well, the ALP is a very short half-life in cats, isn't it? Yeah. Mm. Around very long. So if it is elevated, it's really cool. Yeah. So it's, it's really low. It's like less than 20% of cats, which is really annoying. Makes it hard to diagnose. They're more likely to have hyperbilirubinemia than they are ALP elevations. ALT goes up pretty reliably. So about, around about 70% of cats will have an ALT elevation. These are ballparks. Don't quote me in your exam, please. Uh, uh, yeah, so much more likely to have ALT and a little bit of hyperbilirubinemia and a neutrophilia, and that should kind of direct you in that it might be biliary direction. But biliary infection is probably highly underdiagnosed. Like if you think about how often we do a cystocentesis and diagnose a bladder infection, if we were tapping all the gallbladders we saw, we'd see infections in there quite commonly. Um, so along with if you've got a pyrexia of unknown origin that your suspicious is bacterial, gallbladder, urinary bladder and lungs are usually where those infections are hiding. Um, and you've got, yeah, unfortunately in cats, your bloods might be normal. Dogs are much better at showing you when they have gallbladder disease. Um, so what about... Um, what are you going to do about that patient that comes in, has a mild ALP elevation, has a hyperbilirubinemia, it's about 90, and an ALT of about 270? What's your next step? Ultrasound. <laughs> Yeah, I would too. Um, and on the ultrasound, you see a hyperechoic gallbladder wall, mineralized sludge within the gallbladder, and a tiny bit of free fluid surrounding the gallbladder. How are you going to then confirm your diagnosis? Would you culture the bile? You could, you could. that's really the only way to confirm your diagnosis. Um, what's the most common organisms that you see in there? Would it be some GIT, uh, uh, E. coli? Good, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and? Enterococcus, probably. Yes, excellent. And? What are those gas in there? On ultrasound. So does that mean it's an anaerobic bacteria, like some anaerobes there? Clostridium. Yeah. yeah, gas forming organisms. Um, so there are very limited gas forming organisms. Clostridia is by far and away the most common, um, but there's a subtype of E. coli that can produce gas. Um, so if you do see emphysematous cholangitis, which is the name of cholangitis with gas in it, um, uh, it's almost always clostridia. What is your antimicrobial choice going to be if you see that? Penicillin. Good. Yep. Any others? There's more than one right answer here. So Metronidazole. Good, excellent, yeah. So what if we're not talking about gas in the gallbladder? What if we're talking about gas in a hepatic abscess? Is there one out of penicillin and metronidazole? Is there one that's gonna be superior? But if it's an abscess, isn't it that like the penetration is not as efficient? So typically with abscesses, like because they're walled off, you mm -hmm. ideally should uh, I don't know, do what? <laughs> Take that abscess out. But with liver, obviously, you can't. I don't know. There's this thing with medical management versus surgic, like lobectomy. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Good. Okay. So, say, let's say on your ultrasound, we found a five centimeter liver mass, which extends right up to the high um, hilus of the liver, 
and is closely associated with vessels, aka non-surgical. And in the lumen of that mass, or not in the lumen, in within that mass is an area of echogenic fluid that contains gas. So it's non-surgical. Well, the PKA would be better for um, uh, penicillin derivative. Would it? Um, Penetration, penetration yeah. to anaerobic areas, metronidazole, is the bee's knees. Mm. So it's pretty much the only antibiotic which will get right into an area that has no blood flow. It's got excellent penetration to, um, to necrotic tissue. Mm. It's got such a narrow spectrum that has very limited applications. But in this situation, if you've got gas in a necrotic area, metronidazole is going to get you over the line usually. Mm -hmm. Um, these dog, these animals are so unwell. This happens much more commonly in dogs, just because of the incidence of liver tumors that we see in dogs. Why would in you? That in that example that you just gave, would you be able to uh, pass a needle and at least drain some of the pus out? Like that way, you're making it smaller, and then hopefully more or better antibiotic penetration. Yes. Yeah, so there's a couple of different things you can do. Um, draining it is not. It's definitely not curative, but it buys you kind of 24 hours to get the it for penetration to improve penetration to that area before it refills again. Um, the trouble with what is the trouble with doing a needle aspirate of an abscess within the abdomen? Surely the risk of peritonitis. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Um, so I do do it under very controlled situations where I'm quite happy that I can drain the entire contents of the abscess. If the abscess looks like it, there's multiple different kind of parts in it, and I think I might be able to drain that part, but then I'm still going to leave pressure in the abscess or in other parts, then I'm pretty conservative about draining them. Um, again, probably not a membership um, level question, but are there any, if we've got a needle in that abscess and we've drained the pus out, is there anything therapeutic we can do? Can you put the antibiotic in there? Like inject the antibiotic local penetration right? we don't do antibiotic usually you do ethanol ablation mm, which is so much fun uh, so we just put straight ethanol into the abscess which is obviously antibacterial uh, and it causes a lot of inflammation in there but then it causes sclerosis so if you cause inflammation in a round structure then you get stricturing and fibrosis as around structure and it closes down and it just removes that potential space and decreases the risk of refilling. Um, so in non-surgical patients, that's a good option, minimally invasive option, but they have to be, unfortunately, a lot of liver abscesses have very solid pus. So you mm. can't drain them properly and you can't get the ethanol in there. Like you're just going to be contracting it around a big blob of very solid pus that the body can't clear. So um Hard to manage. Um, what about, where am I up to? Still, uh, let's go back to cats again. And this is a well cat who had a ALP elevation of 197 diagnosed on pre-GA bloods. Um, and you did an ultrasound, and there was a mildly hyperechoic gallbladder wall and diffusely hyperechoic and enlarged liver. What's your next step going to be? Would you still not culture the bile? Yeah. Um, what if, uh, I mean, you know, profile. sorry, say again, would you set up for liver biopsy? Yeah, I would. Yeah. The coag profile next. <clears throat> Excellent. Make sure that we did hematology and got a platelet count. Um, but I think liver biopsy in that situation where there's hepatic parenchymal changes and ultrasound is not a sensitive test for hepatic parenchymal changes. So if you're seeing it on ultrasound, it's a big change. Um, what, what are our differentials in this situation? 
lymphoma, mm -hmm. hepatic lipidosis. Yep, would be unusual in a well cat, but there's certainly metabolic causes of that that aren't necessarily illness associated. Cholangiohepatitis. Yeah, exactly. What sort? Um, lymphocytic plasmacity. Most likely. What other forms are there? Neutrophilic. Yep. Granulo granulomatous. Good. One more. Eosinophilic. Yes, excellent. Good. Um, so this cat is from tropical north end of Australia. And you do a biopsy of the liver and see eosinophils. What might be the causes of eosinophilic cholangiohepatitis? Endoparasitosis. Good. Yes. What was that? Sorry. Liver fluke. Fluke, yeah. Um, has anybody seen fluke? No. Not that I know of. No. <laughs> I don't see many cats from Wiggle. Smallies. Shape, yes. Yeah. Do you see it in um, in Wagga region, Jeff, or is it only north? Uh, no, I've never seen it. In cats. So I've read about it in America in um, yeah. southern uh, southern parts, but I didn't know we had it in Australia actually. Mm, far north, apparently. And and in like Southeast Asia, quite common, apparently. I've never seen it. Um what other so still on eosinophilic, we've got um parasitism. So what what actually causes the um, eosinophilic hepatitis with um, endoparasitism. If it's just the type of antigenic stimulation that you get, like it causes eosinophils to be increased. And when, when we say endoparasitism, are we talking about worms just in the gastrointestinal tract? Where are they? There could be in the thoracic cavity. Yeah. I'm, what I'm getting at, I'm not asking the question very well, is that what I'd want to, what I'd have on my answer key would be visceral larval migraines. Mm -hmm. So it's actually migration of the larvae through the liver rather than like a reactive change. Mm -hmm. All right. What about if, we did our biopsy and it was lymphocytic um, inflammation. Again, cholangitis, predominantly cholangitis and no minimal involvement of the hepatocytes, but we've got a secondary um, cholestatic hepatitis. Um, what, what are the potential causes of lymphocytic other than immune mediated? Again, it's isn't it chronic infection like chronic chronicity? I think so. Yeah. Um, what what infections have been associated with that? Like, would you expect E. coli to cause that? Uh, no. No. There's one in particular I want you guys to get if you can. Viral. Good. Yes. Thank you. Um, what viruses are associated with lymphoplasmatic cholangitis? Stigmonegia, mm -hmm. FIP. Good, excellent. You could pretty much say any of them to give you guys a hint. <laughs> so FIP, give me some more cat viruses. Khaleesi, Good. Okay. But with the Khaleesi, because it's that form that makes them really unwell. 
fulminant policy. Yeah. That mm-hmm. wouldn't be this, right? Because this is more slow and it's not really causing the cat to be that sick. Very unlikely. Yeah, exactly. So that's a really good good point. The history that I've given you is not consistent with systemic virulent Khaleesi virus. So we sorry, when you, when you... Without FIP? Are, you pardon? Are we talking about coronavirus without FIP as well? Uh, it shouldn't cause hepatitis. So coronavirus should only cause gastrointestinal inflammation if it's not FIP. Uh, Anna, with this with the signal met for this case, did you say that it's um, biochem and CBC was completely normal except for mild ALT elevations? Or did I, I make that up? You said ALP. ALP. Yeah. 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 Like yeah. yeah, it was quite high. Yeah, and the ALT was probably about equivalent to that. I think yeah. so. completely fictional. Mm-hmm. Um, other viruses. FELV. FELV, FELV. Good, excellent. Um, why? So this is a, the FELV is definitely associated with inflammatory liver diseases. Um, but the mechanism is really tricky. So I, it's a re- this could be a really hard question to make a, um, an exam question on. So FELV is associated with anemia, which causes hypoperfusion of the liver, which causes liver necrosis which causes inflammation. So you're not going to see FELV causing primary hepatitis without a concurrent anemia, which you're going to be more worried about. Like you're going to, this is going to be kind of an appropriate liver change associated with a degree of anemia. So technically FELV is on all the lists, but practically it's not the cause of a primary hepatitis with no anemia. FELV is really rare in Australia though, isn't it? It's really rare. Well, it's really rare relative to other countries, but it, it's like the incidents were still like two in a hundred or something like that. Yeah, it's a low incidence, yes. Yeah, but I, I mean, I see a hundred cats easy in a year, and if two of them have got FELV, then that's a significant disease. I don't think that the population that I see, uh, that's the incidence. I'm not sure what population in Australia they did that testing on. <laughs> Probably strays. Just exactly. There might yeah. be a little bit of bias towards um, the cats living in colony situations. <laughs> and it's northern hemispherical disease more than that is. Exactly. Yeah. But yeah, that's Matt's got a very good point. And I've seen this before with a lot of things that. There's, there's a referral institution bias mm-hmm. uh, so that there might be one in a hundred get referred, but of course the people that write the papers that write about the one in a hundred. Yes. Whereas the 99 don't get written about that were treated successfully in general practice. Exactly. Yeah, it's a big, big flaw in veterinary studies in particular. Um, what about FIV? Can that cause hepatitis or cholangitis? You already gave the hint that they all can. They all can, yeah. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> um, uh, so how would FIP cause hepatitis? Cholangitis, I should say. There's lots of macrophages in the liver and they've all got their little virus going on. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually, um, obviously they don't, there's probably multifactorial reasons, but what I was getting at is immunosuppression. So the liver is more vulnerable to ascending infection and more reactive to normal kind of enterohepatic bacterial circulation. If the bacteria comes up the portal vein, gets sucked up by the reticular endothelial system, spat out again into the bile and then goes back down into the bowel. Um, So that's just a normal cycle. Um, so much more vulnerable. There's one really interesting association with lymphocytic um, cholangitis in cats, and that's Helicobacter. So Helicobacter, we're not really sure what the significance of Helicobacter infection is in cats because it's so different from humans, very significant in humans, but humans get intracellular um, Helicobacter, whereas cats and dogs don't. 
Um, and we'll, I'm sure we'll talk about that more at some point. But um, uh, yeah, there's an interesting association now that we're doing more PCR and fish to identify a presence of bacteria in tissue when we do a biopsy. Um, we're detecting more um, genetic material from Helicobacter in feline cholangitis. Um, what, we've done viruses, we've done bacteria. Um, say we had an eosinophilic, back to an eosinophilic inflammatory pattern. What, um, what other organisms could cause it? Could mycoplasma do it? Yes, might, um, yes. I'm not sure what sort of inflammation. I think that would be more lymphoplasmicity because it's a chronicity and low grade infection. Um, potentially neutrophilic. I don't think it would be eosinophilic. Which, which organisms cause eosinophilic responses? Other than parasites. We'll put the like wedding music on. Set a timer. Um, uh, I think is it protozoal organisms as well, yeah. um, and um, some neoplasias. But I think yeah. you said good, excellent, uh, and in fact, one more organism. So we've done protozoa, we've done viruses, we've done bacteria, mycobacteria, mycobacteria. What will cause what sort of inflammation? Granulomatous. Good. Okay, back to eosinophilic. But good. Hint. Bacteria. Fungal. Fungal, Fungal. yes. <laughs> <laughs> We've done everything else. <laughs> About prions. <laughs> yes. Yeah. yeah, sorry, we didn't do prions. <laughs> Um, so there's, there's not very many fungal causes of hepatitis in Australia or all the like blastomycosis and histoplasmosis and stuff overseas, um, but aspergillosis, mm. crypto and sporothrix all in Australia can cause hepatitis. Mm. So worth having on your radar. Typically cats are immunosuppressed if they're getting weird fungal infections in their liver, but we see cats with FIV, cats on immunosuppressive medications. So it's definitely something that should be on your radar. We haven't mentioned hyperosinophilic syndrome. I haven't, I haven't mentioned that, actually. That's a good point. As a cause of eosinophilic inflammatory change in the liver. Cats or dogs? And wouldn't the eosinophils be high on the blood, the CBC? Mostly. I have to say, patients with hyperosinophilic syndrome, cats typically have gastrointestinal disease as their presenting sign. And dogs have like weird lung lesions and things. I haven't, I haven't been conscious of seeing one with a hepatitis. Is that anybody, does anybody else have different experience? Theoretically, you do a biopsy, you're gonna see more eosinophils if there's more eosinophils in periphery in circulation. But I don't think that's necessarily an in, in, in infiltrate of eosinophils in the liver. Um, okay, do we want to talk, are there any topics you guys want to cover or any questions? Because we could either talk about management and treatment of chronic hepatitis, or we could go down the hepatic encephalopathy route or shunting route. You guys have already done the question on shunts. If you want to mind some management treatment. Um, management treatment. I think that's probably the most <laughs> practical yeah. thing to talk about. There's also this the new like poor product which they are. Hmm. It's got like vitamin E, semi, and um, silymarin in it, and they're talking about you know they're promoting that for chronic use as well as acute and mm -hmm. um, I guess um, I wouldn't mind going through the indications because previously I've used say semi and silymarin for acute but not so much chronic disease and I guess yeah. indications for that sort of treatment. Yeah, for sure. 
Um, so chronic hepatitis, what is, so we're, we're going to talk more about dogs because I think dogs tend to get more that kind of chronic proper hepatitis stuff where we're putting them on semi and stuff. Um, so what I'm saying doesn't necessarily apply to cats. Um, what is the cause of most chronic hepatitis or what, what is the classification of most hepatitis in dogs? It'll be copper, like top, copper community. There is often copper in there, but usually the copper is secondary to inflammation. But I, it is kind of a trick question. It's idiopathic. Like we never right. find out the cause in the first place. Um, it could have been an ascending infection. It could have been a systemic infection. It could have been like a medication they got when they were two that just triggered the immune system to start recognizing elements of the liver, whether it be kind of cholangiocytes, um, hepatocytes, or um, like reticular endothelial system cells as something to attack, essentially, something to mount a response to. Or even the stroma. So there's sort of documents of documented um, antibodies towards like elements of the um, extracellular matrix and stuff. Um, so we've got inflammation that's been developed at some point, and that inflammation has shifted towards being a constructive infl inflammatory response against something to being an inflammatory response which is harming um, the own tissue. Um, so what sort of damage are we going to be getting in the liver broadly? Fibrosis. 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 Excellent. Let me get my list. Um, so yeah, when we're looking, I'm going to word that differently. When we're looking at a biopsy, what parameters are we, or what, what are we, what do we want to assess to understand how we're going to treat it? The location of the hepatocellular injury and the extent of fibrosis and where it's yeah. located. Yes, excellent. Copper status. Copper, excellent. How are, oh, this is a tricky question. How are you going to assess that? Can you either stain for it or like weigh it or something? Yeah, good. Excellent. Um, I don't know why rubianic acid just sticks in my mind. That's the stain for it, but mm -hmm. you can quantify quite nicely oh. now with smaller bits of tissue um, with the weighing technique, I think the quantification technique. Um, okay. So we've got the pattern and location of inflammation. We've got whether there is fibrosis present. What's the difference between fibrosis and cirrhosis? Cirrhosis, you get an overall reduction in hepatic size and um, function uh, function loss as opposed to no function loss, I guess. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, so the, the, the key part there is the reduction in hepatic size. So with fib when fibrosis becomes, we call it bridging fibrosis, it goes between the portal tracts and between the portal triad and the central vein and it contracts those lobules and it sets those little um, sort of smaller functional units of the liver up as little islands rather than all kind of working together. And then because fibrosis, fibrotic tissue contracts, it squashes and damages those tissues and it starts to cause its own cholestatic problems and inflammatory problems. Um, so cirrhosis is when it becomes bridging on a histo level. Um, what else are we assessing for? Cell type. Well, like, is it would, like fish, would you would you consider doing like that kind of work now? Yep, absolutely. So I wouldn't like submit a sample and say I want to do fish on this straight away unless I had a really high index of suspicion, like known exposure to a fluke area or something like that. Um, uh, but I would certainly do it as an add-on if I saw what type of inflammation. Neutrophilic. 
neutrophilic or oh, even maybe lymphoplasmas that did you should you still do it i would also be quite interested with lymphoplasmic inflammation um with eosinophilic inflammation the chances of it being bacterial and therefore appropriate with fish um it's pretty slim so i probably wouldn't do it with eosinophilic inflammation but that's so rare um granulomatous inflammation what special stains am i going to be asking for for mycobacterium good do you know what it's called do i know what it's Zil- called? Zil- Zil- or good. something good acid fast staining for acid fast. So i had a case once that's why it's in my head ah yes perfect <laughs> so do you feel like yeah. not not for not for uh, not hepatic but generally mycobacterium so that's why i kind of mm-hmm. um now there's one Oh, ooh. okay, we're going to go back there later. Sorry. Um, so they're the things that I'm kind of assessing for on the biopsy. So location of an inflammation and pattern of the inflammation, what sort of cellular infiltrate is it? Um, and the extent of the fibrosis. So whether we're kind of, once it gets bridging fibrosis, I'm like, oh, this is pretty bad. It's pretty terminal. Um, so... Once we've kind of said, okay, it's bog standard um, chronic hepatitis, idiopathic chronic hepatitis, we've ruled out infectious causes or persistent infection. It might have been infectious originally. Um, What other testing do I want to do which is going to help me guide treatment? The bilirubin is not elevated on my biochem. Uh, Bile acid. Exactly. Why am I interested in that? To see what the liver function is doing. Excellent. Okay, and this is a dog with um, no indication of um, liver failure. What am I looking at on my testing, on my normal biochem profile? We did this last week, but I'll make you do it again. Albumin, glucose, urea, urea, cholesterol. Excellent. Um, and we've done bile acids, which are elevated, but they're only mildly elevated. So that postprandial is like 35 or something like that. Um, so on our histo, there's fibrosis, but not bridging fibrosis. And we've got a lymphoplasmacytic infiltrate. Um, How are we going to manage this patient who doesn't have liver failure and needs a decrease in the amount of inflammation to limit fibrosis? What sort of broad categories do we need to Dietary have? manipulation. Yeah. I expected that from you, Matt. <laughs> what did he say? Yeah. <clears throat> Dietary manipulation. I guess I guess you're probably thinking about pred too. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. So um, let's put pred. Do we want to put pred in the anti-inflammatory, anti-fibrotic, or immunosuppressive category? All three. All three. <laughs> you pick three boxes with one drug. <clears throat> um. So let's talk about medications we're going to use to decrease inflammation. Pred being one of them. And we're trying to do two things, decrease active inflammation and decrease um, the immune activity in the area. Um, The PRED has the extra benefit over the other drugs of doing that anti-inflammatory and antifibrotic piece as well as the immunosuppression. What other options are there? Or what are the limitations of PRED in treating chronic liver disease? Occult infection. Good, yeah. Is true for all of the immunosuppressants. What about PRED specifically? Do you worry about like it causing uh, vacuolar hepat- hepatopathy mm-hmm. on top of whatever else is going on in the liver? Exactly, yeah. Um, so it causes a metabolic hepatopathy. And how are you then going to monitor your response to therapy? Clinical? No, the dog's already well. <laughs> well yeah. Repeat biopsy. Yeah. You could do a biopsy for sure. Just more um, looking at ALT versus ALP. Yeah. It's hard. 
Mm. Like fine pred. Like I feel like there's really good clinical ben- the clinical theoretical benefits to prednisolone, but I don't know whether I'm making a difference to the dogs. And then side um, effect wise, I feel like it's less well tolerated than the other medications. So what other options do we have for immunosuppressants? Cyclo, Cyclo, Would you use azathioprine because, like, hepato? I mean, this is already a hepatic problem. Though. Would you use uh, azathioprine versus cyclosporin? Um, yes, I would because azathioprine tends to cause an idiosyncratic drug mm. reaction. So I would, and then I just recheck the ALT two weeks later, and then another eight weeks later because it can be quite delayed. Um, and just make sure that it's not bouncing up. Um, so there's really good guidelines for how much it's allowed to bounce after starting ALT, uh, after the ALT is allowed to bounce after starting azathioprine. Um, so I just follow those guidelines. Mm. Um, I like azathioprine because it doesn't impact the appetite as often as cyclosporin does, doesn't make them nauseous. Um, uh, and it, yeah, it's cheap, which... Sometimes cyclosporin, particularly in large breed dogs, is just mm. out of reach. Um, okay. What about the liver supportive medications? In this case, what is the argument for using SAMI? The, it'll help with the increasing glutathione, which is the antioxidant. Exactly. And what else, when we're talking about detoxification two weeks ago, what else does glut? What is glutathione's role in detoxification? Something to do with the ATP pump, is it? Um, well, I don't know. It binds. <laughs> sorry, it binds to, to the metabolite and water soluble. That just helps them be excreted, essentially. Um, so the more glutathione you've got in there, the more detoxification capacity you've got. And what happens if you've got a toxin that? can't be detoxified because there's no glutathione left. If you've got a toxin sitting in the hepatocyte, what's going to happen? It may cause death of that hepatocyte. It's going to cause what, sorry? Death. Yeah, exactly. So then we're going to get inflammation, then we're going to get swelling, and it's going to perpetuate that inflammatory response. So we need to maximise detoxification and excretion of toxins by maximizing our glutathione in the cells. Um, so SAMI does that, that's the thiol donor. It, it generates more glutathione detoxification capacity. Um, Silamarin has the best evidence-based medicine evidence for it um, as a liver support medication. It has antioxidant effects, it increases bioflow, um, and when we say antioxidant, we mean decreases oxidant damage associated with um, the toxin accumulation in the cells. Um, the evidence isn't target species of, um, if for dogs, but it's, it's generally recognised as an antifibrotic agent in herbal medicine as well. <clears throat> so which is a really strong indication for it in this mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. setting. And probably um, anti-inflammatory as well. Yeah. <clears throat> Uh, definitely anti-inflammatory, even just by the decreased oxidant damage. So oxidant damage is going to cause the inflammation. So just in that really strong evidence for the use of silymarin. And then vitamin E works in a similar way in, in that it's an antioxidant. Um, I can't remember what the other benefits are, but the three of them together there's really strong evidence for their use almost over any drug for hepatitis. So particularly in a chronic setting, it's really costly to do all of them. But if you, now that we've got that hepatoprotect poor product, there is no downside. There's virtually zero side effects of any of those medications. They make a huge difference. What about Ursaphor? Would you use that? If there's Exactly. So how on your biopsy, that's something else we should have mentioned. We need to assess for whether there's cholestasis, intrahepatic cholestasis, because that ursifork will not just help flush the gallbladder. It will improve flow through those canaliculi 
which are kind of being pushed shut by swollen hepatocytes. And I think we would displace the the more toxic um, you know, bile acids within the bile acid pool. Yeah. It's more hydrophilic. Yes, exactly. Now I am going to have to cut all of you off. I apologize. But um, very nice talking to you all. Good luck. Thank you. Thank you. Is it next week? No, it's a week it's after. A, no, it's like three weeks away. Oh, you'll be fine. All right. We're doing um, metabolic liver diseases, vascular and um, neoplastic disorders next fortnight. So I'll see you all then. Great. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. Have a nice weekend, everyone. Yeah, you Thanks. too. You too.